Hey, Ray, how you doing? Doing awesome, man. Fantastic. Sunny so, day here the, in Colorado. Yeah. Oh, I know. I hate that because, um, <laughs> you know, typically, typically Colorado, especially this time of year in the winter time, you guys have got your snow, you've got your ice, you've got your cloudy skies and the cold. And me in, in Los Angeles, I usually have the sun. And today is the exact opposite of that. We've got like the, the hundred year <laughs> rainstorm happening here. And, and this is when it's, it's almost, it's kind of embarrassing because, you know, it rains for a few days and then, you know, the governor announces a state of emergency and like, everyone's like, oh my gosh, like kids get out of school. And it's like, (laughs) what are you talking about? It's raining. And like, you know, give me a break. It's it's just (laughs) raining. And, and yes, some, every now and then there's a little too much water for the road, but you know, you typically, you just drive through it and the car is just fine. So, um, but that said, I got kicked out of my office as I was telling Ray before we started recording, but now I'm telling the listeners we got, I got kicked out of my office where I have the setup, you know, I've got the studio, I've got the pro mic, I've got everything dialed in. Now I'm at home because the office got flooded. So uh, we've got a bunch of wet carpet there and they needed to bring in those big loud fans. And so I had to come home for this interview. So if my audio is not as good listeners, please forgive me for this one episode. But here we are. We got Ray. Give him a break. (laughs) That's right. Just relax, people. You know, leave me alone on Instagram. Okay. No, no uh, bad (laughs) messages on Instagram. Okay. So for those of you listeners who don't know Ray, he's a Colorado hairdresser who focuses on cutting. Ray, you're the founder of the Bob Company. Uh, on, on Instagram, you're yep. the Bob, B-O-B, Co. Uh, Art Scissors yep. and From Professional Ambassador, and you're the owner of Voltage Salon in Colorado. And uh, north of Denver, right? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, remind me of the yeah. city? Yeah, so we're up in, I'm up in Fort Collins. Fort Collins. So it's an hour north, hour north of Denver. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful there. I've been up there, and it's it great. Is. And you guys have been growing. I'm yeah. right. I mean that cool the, town. yeah. So I mean, I know Denver has been growing a lot, especially post COVID. People have been moving from California, and they've been moving to places like Colorado and Texas, etc. But uh, I know a lot of people yeah. have been moving into those northern kind of suburbs of Denver. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So let's let's start with you. Where are you from and how did you get into this business? Okay. So I moved, to, I moved to Colorado when I was like a little kid. So I was originally – I was born in Arizona, moved to Colorado. So I grew up – I literally still live in the same town I grew up in. So it's kind of a wild, wild trip sometimes because like – I like work in a building that like didn't exist when I was a kid, you know, like I, I saw this building get built. Like, it's just crazy. Like I, the half the side of town, it's, it's just wild. You know, I raise my kids here now and like, I go to the same parks that I went to when I was a kid, which is just, it's one of those kind of mind trips a little bit. I love that. Yeah. So yeah, so it's pretty fun. Uh, good, really good area to live in. I mean, it's Fort Collins is always like, it's like on the top five places to live in the U S like every year. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. It's got tons of things to do, lots of outdoor stuff and, um, you know, lots of fun restaurants and breweries and parks everywhere. So I love living here. And then, yeah, it's got like a big, um, there's a couple tech companies out here. Um, there's lots of, uh, just lots of businesses, lots of, I feel like lots of entrepreneurial kind of spirit in uh, the area where I live. Um, which is really fun and exciting to be a part of. That's awesome. So how did you make your way into this business? So I, uh, I was 20, I was 24, 20, I think I was like 24, 25 right when I went into hair school. And, uh, my sister-in-law actually, uh, is a hairdresser. And so she was the one who kind of piqued my interest in it. Like this was back in like when I was like 18 though, she like, she was like, dude, when you're done with high school, you need to go to hair school. And I was always kind of like, I'd probably dig that. You know, it's like, I was kind of into the idea. So it was always like on the back of my mind, but I, I went in after high school, I went, worked with my dad for 12, 15 years, I guess it would have been. Well, yeah, about 12 years, I guess. And I um, was a dental lab technician. I made fake teeth. Is what I did. (laughs) So uh, like veneers, veneers, gold crown, stuff like that. And then the hair thing kept coming up. 
And uh, I had actually even a couple of friends who were like, dude, have you ever thought about going to hair school? Just really based on the fact that like, I liked wearing my hair like in a cool way. And I, I actually usually I grew up with my mom cutting my hair. I never went to a salon once in my life growing up. My mom always cut my hair and she was not a hairdresser. <laughs> And I, I'm sure you, I'm sure you look, moved out, I'm sure you had some great haircuts. <laughs> you know, I honestly, they were, I had it honestly, my mom did for a good job for some reason. I, I had a couple, maybe I looked back and they were, they were a little wide, you know, that she didn't blend them quite right. But overall, I mean, she did a pretty dang good job with my hair. And, uh, and then I moved out and, you know, got married and all that. And I would, I would just kind of cut my own hair and, you know, probably half the time it wasn't that great in the back because I can never reach. I still can't cut my hair very well myself. Of course. <laughs> but um, anyway, <laughs> finally, I finally jumped into hair school. Um, I had my we had had my first um, child. My you know my wife and I had our first child, and so it was like she was a baby while I was going through the first part of hair school. And anyway, just kind of it just all snowballed from there. Yeah, so you got in a little bit later. You got married first. You got a, you had a kid first, and then you had a career change, which was, I mean, was that uncomfortable? It, yeah, I mean, it was actually, it wasn't necessarily uncomfortable, but it was exciting. Um, I mean, it was uncomfortable in ways because, I, you know, like I said, I was married. I had a baby. I owned a house. And starting out as a hairdresser, you don't make that kind of money. So the first, the first two years of my, of my career in hair was I worked, and this was even during school, but I worked from 7 a.m. in the morning till 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the afternoon. Then I worked in the salon from 3 o'clock in the afternoon till 9 o'clock at night. I did that for two years. Wow. wow. Yeah. Like, and, I, wow. So, and then like plus Saturdays you know, in the salon, you know, I had to work every – I think it was every other Saturday I worked. And so – it was a lot definitely for two years, but it was still kind of exciting at the same time um, to where I, I felt like I was, it was when, it was the moment I went to hair school. It was like, oh yeah, this is, I should have done this 10 years ago. You know, it was that moment. I was like, this is, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Got it. So probably relieving a little bit more than nerve wracking uh, because you're going where you, where, where you really want to go. And, and what was it about it that made you feel that way? I, I had always been a very like artistic, creative person where I, I liked working with my hands. Um, I really enjoyed working with my hands. I, I liked making things and creating either paintings or drawings. I drew a lot as a kid, painted some. Um, I like just my dad had a workshop. We used to go out into the workshop with him and you know, mess around with wood and carving and stuff like that. And um, so I think it was just that moment of like, Oh, I can, and I was always oddly also, I was always kind of like into like fashion and trends and kind of, you know, like that side of the world. And I don't know, it just felt like this like moment of like those two things colliding for me, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, art and fashion and like I could do this and actually make money. I don't know. It was just kind of an amazing moment, I guess. Totally. And what about music? You, you strike me as potentially being somebody who was a musician. Oh yeah, so I de I definitely grew up in sort of a sort of a musical household. My brother played guitar, my dad played guitar, my mom was a singer. They sang. You know, we grew, oh, I grew wow. up in church, playing a lot um, at church and stuff like that. So I was actually a drummer. Um, oh. So I always enjoyed performing. Um, I sang a little bit as well, um, and so yeah, I played in, played in bands over the years. We you know play around town. Nothing ever major, but uh, it was right. it was good times. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, on, all of it is making sense now. Okay, so you found your you found your calling. You go to beauty school. Uh, were you uh, was beauty school easy for you, or or were you good right away, or not? I would say I, I would say it was I was I, I I think I naturally gravitated to to hair like to doing hair. I definitely don't think it was easy. I definitely think though. Like I got into a rhythm with it and understanding of it fairly quickly compared to a lot of my schoolmates. Okay. Um, so I was, I was the one. A lot of times they were coming to and asking questions, like, you know, like if, if the teacher wasn't available, they would a lot of times come to me and ask me, "Am I doing this right? Or how did we do that again?" 
And, you know, a lot of a lot of even the students there were like, uh, you know, willing to let me like cut their hair. Um, I was I got very into like the avant garde stuff for a while, like doing really mm-hmm. wild things with hair. I did a bunch of that stuff uh, early on in my career. So, yeah. Very good. All right. So you graduate and you were good at it already. And where'd you go? I, I, I went to the, in my opinion, the top salon in my town um, at the time. And uh, I really got a really good setup there. Um, it was a commission based salon. So I was, uh, you know, I was an employee slash commission stylist. And I spent uh, three and a half years at that salon. And during that time, got a ton of uh, training through Paul Mitchell, uh, uh, cutting, coloring, all that stuff. We went to the gathering like four times while I was working at that mm-hmm. salon. Um, so I had a really good, a really good like base with them. Um, even during school, I did a lot of like outside classes. Like I did a couple classes with, uh, Aquaj, uh, the, uh, Eric Fisher and Louis Alvarez and, um, just, just got, I just was very, very, very hungry to like learn more and more and more about hair. And I think it was due to the fact that I got into it late and I felt mm. like I just was like, I wanted, I wanted to become, I was just, I always wanted to become like, I don't know, like that master level. Um, and so I just felt like I always wanted to learn, learn, learn. And I'm still kind of that way too. Like, I'm just always like, you know, what can we, what can I learn next? You know? Mm-hmm. And your maturity probably helped a lot with that, right? And you had had life experience, you had experience, doing something else, a career doing something else. And um, that probably lent to your uh, your confidence, you know, your experience generally in life, which which might have made it easier for you to really dig in to, to hair, maybe easier to recognize how much more you liked hair than what you're doing previously. Which, because some people, when they go to hair school, they're not really sure if they want, it's especially a lot of young people, they want to do three or four things and they end up going to hair school and they're always kind of unsure whether they're in the right place or not, right? And so they they get burnt out easily and they don't really attack it with all of their passion. I would agree. Yeah, I think that me kind of already like, experiencing a lot of life, I guess, uh, that definitely like put a fire under me that I was like, okay, you already know you didn't like figured you didn't want to do that for the rest of your life. So like, and I think it was like that moment I said, I was like, this was it. Like, this is what I was meant to do. And I still feel that way. But yeah, like, I think it, it just propelled me for sure. Okay, so you're at the best salon in Fort Collins. You're there for three and a half years, commission salon. You're learning a lot. You're traveling. You're going to the gathering. You're you're going to good classes. You're ambitious. And and then what did you do? So then um, I hit that point of, you know, kind of thinking, like, I think I always kind of wanted to own a salon, or I think I had that in me, like, from the time I started, I think at some point I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to want to own a salon or have my own thing. And so anyway, I, I jumped out of that salon and I started booth renting. So I did an independent contractor situation. Uh, and for, I only did that for about, I guess I did that for a year. And during that year, I met my business partner. His name is Mark, uh, Mark Cottle. And he was a salon owner in Las Vegas for a number of years and anyway, he moved to Fort Collins, me and him, uh, he came to start working at the salon I was at and we became like instant, instant brothers. Like we were just very instantaneously friends. And anyway, we worked together for several months and then I was approached with an opportunity to, um, have a salon space. And so I, me and him had sort of talked about the p- potential of us doing a salon together. And so. We just, it, it, it just happened very, very quickly. I, me and him, we'd, we'd worked together for maybe six months, and then we decided to open our salon called Voltage Salon together in 2016. Super cool. Okay. And, and has that been a good partnership? Yeah. 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 Me and him are, we just have a really, really, really good partnership. We're just very like open with each other. We have a very like, I always tell people this when you're about to get into business with somebody, in my opinion, we have very similar, like just worldview. 
um, the way we view life, the way we operate our life, the way we believe that people should be treated. And so I think it's just lent itself well to us owning a salon together for the past almost nine years now. So love it. Love it. Okay. So yeah. at this point, yeah. here we are 2024 and are you behind the chair 99% of the time? Are you traveling? Um, with these ambassadorships, do they take you on the road? Yeah. So I, so I'll get, this is, this is about to get into a long story, but I'll tell you what, okay. what happened in the, in, in the, in all those years. But so uh, yeah, 2024, yeah, I still own the salon, Voltage Salon. And, um, but back in 2000 and I guess it would have been 2015, maybe, uh, while I was still booth renting, I started, bec I became an educator for the Kevin Murphy company. I was uh, a style educator for them. And I went to several trainings. I was with them for about two years. And during that time, uh, Ryan Whedon and I became very good friends. So Ryan yeah, Whedon great. owns uh, uh, Masters of Balayage. You know, yeah, it's like, mm -hmm. I know you know Ryan. I know everybody mm -hmm. listening knows Ryan. Um, mm -hmm. And anyway, me and him became very, very quick friends. Well, many funny stories I could tell you about me and him. Um, <laughs> but we, we were both, we both started with Kevin Murphy and then, uh, a couple years into that, he was in the process of creating the Masters of Balayage feature page. And, you know, he started featuring my work. And um, also, you know, we would see each other at Kevin Murphy trainings and we, you know, we'd stay in touch all the time. And anyway, he uh, he uh, at one point was like, dude, my classes are getting so big. I need an extra educator to come with me on classes. And so he started inviting inviting me along to come teach because I was teaching Balayage just even on my own at the time. And um it was going well, not huge, but you know, locally in my in my area, Denver, Fort Collins, I would book classes and teach balayage. Anyway, so mm -hmm. I started traveling around with him at, for the first like you know early years of his of Masters of Balayage, and then and then as it progressed, I just I started traveling more and more with them. They got even more and more kind of uh, organized with their company, which is amazing to watch and see mm -hmm. how he did that, how they did that, and uh, so I was with them for like six years. Um, yeah, it was, it was such an amazing experience. I, I met so many cool people through that and their team is just amazing. He's just great at choosing people for his team that, um, just really mesh together, humble people who are real, who don't have these massive egos. I mean, it's just a kind of an amazing thing to, to watch within that company that, um, the way that he lets people sort of shine, but, um, but um, we all just kind of operate. It was very like kind of a cool family, and which I still feel like I'm a part of. So, yeah. so I did that for for yeah a long time, and then just transitioning into now as I I started teaching cutting as well. I I kind of uh, looked at my Instagram, and it was really funny. I was looking at my Instagram one year at the end of the year and seeing what had done the best for me like content wise, and it was all hair cutting videos. Huh. It, I don't know. It was like a weird moment. I was like, what? I was like, what? any of my, you know, my, I was teaching out there, teaching balayage in the world and having a blast and, and people were loving, you know, love the masters of balayage classes. And I was loving it too. I was, I, ha I had fun teaching it for a long time. And, um, okay. It seems like everybody's really liking my haircutting videos. Cause I would, you know, I post some balayage videos sometimes and those were did fine. And, you know, it was back when we were posting more pictures too. And I was posting a lot of balayage yeah. pictures and, you know, posting haircut videos. But anyway, I started posting more haircut videos and noticing that they were doing really, really well. And so I kind of was like, maybe this is my niche. Maybe this is what I, it was kind of almost like Instagram told me, this is what you're mm -hmm. supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't mm -hmm. know. So that, that, that's what I started leaning into, I guess. And then as well as I was still teaching balayage with the mob and Ryan was like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter what you're posting on Instagram. Was, I, I still want you with mob. And I was yeah. having a blast with that. And Anyway, it got to the point though where it was like, okay, I can't, I couldn't do both. I was like, I can't be, I can't be teaching haircutting classes and with mob. It was just getting to be too much. Like, and it, mm -hmm. it was at that moment of like, me and Ryan had chatted. He's like, dude, he's like, you got to do what you got to do, man. He's like, I think you should, if you want, if you're wanting to do that, you got to do it, man. And mm -hmm. so anyway, just great, great friendship, great, great encouragement, um, to me to do that. And, um, you know, he knew and I knew 
mob was gonna mob isn't going anywhere mob was gonna be right. fine you know so yeah. um yeah. but that's when i started the bob company and um yeah it's been just kind of a i don't know the past couple years have been kind of a cool trip with it um with teaching a lot obviously lots of tips and videos going out on instagram with my you know with my ray voltage beauty account but then started the the bob company account as well and um just been interesting to see the growth through that. And then, you know, I'm booking classes. I have classes booked for the half, half of this year already. And then as well as I have online education, which is my Bob University, which is mostly geared towards short haircutting, but I, I do have long hair cutting on there as well. Okay. So not just Bob's, but, but I, I like how yeah. you call it the Bob company because it, it tells somebody immediately, you know, what maybe the focus is or the specialty but but it's not a hundred percent bobs. You've also got some long haircuts in there, and yeah. be, you know the great thing about the, you know naming it the Bob Company is is the Bob has all sorts of variations, right? There's all sorts of derivatives. Yeah. It's not just one thing, right? Right, right. Yeah, there's there's, yeah. there's so many. I have, I have even a module in the online education. It's it's called Many Ways to Cut a Bob, and it's a a, a module in the course where I will. You know, potentially be either adding different videos over the years, you know, like I'll just be adding different videos in there or adding to the videos that are in there. Um, I have some modules in there that are kind of like the basics courses where like takes you through a lot of the basics. Um, and then, you know, the many ways to cut a bob. And then I have, you know, shags, I have pixies, I have long hair. Um, I have, I have so, there's so much I can do with it. And I feel like there's with edu being an educator, especially an independent educator, you can really go, where you're, I guess, where you're, you're the people who follow you on, on social media or find you online. I mean, you can go anywhere they want you to go, I guess. You know, if they need something, it's like, well, I can create a course for that, you know? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's fun. And, 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 and the other thing about a Bob is that, uh, that there, it doesn't matter what the trends are. There's always a short haircut that, that could be considered a variation of Bob. And then of course it, you know, it trends, yep in a certain direction. And I, I was looking at one of your Instagram posts and you were showing kind of one of those old, um, maybe late eighties style of very rounded graduated sort of yeah. bobs that comes around. And of course, you know, you, you look at that, I'm 48 years old. So I look at that and I recognize exactly when that was a popular yeah. haircut. Right. But you know, we yeah. have it, we have modern versions of it. And, and so, I mean, it's such an iconic, uh, a haircut with all of its variations that that applies so much to um, to ranges of time. So so why don't you give us kind of you know your expert opinion of where we are currently, you know with with bobs like wh where are things moving? <laughs> okay, I will. I'll do my best. You know I'm I'm one of those. I think I'm one of those stylists who kind of like I do think that when people ask you like trends, like, especially when clients are like, Oh, what's the trends? And it's, it's the hair, it's the hair industry. So I always am like, there's always a trend for everybody. Like there's no, like, I feel like there's no one thing that's ever like this, this Bob or this haircut. I feel like there's like right now, like with the Bob, there's, you know, the butterfly Bob and there's, there was like the bottleneck Bob for a while. There's like, all these names and like the kitty cut, which is kind of like the lob with, you know, long, a little bit of long layering and some texture. And there's like, you know, there's obviously the curtain bangs with the bobs and the lobs and things like that. So I just feel like there's always like some sort of trend and they, they name it. I don't know who names them. I don't know, but <laughs> I think <laughs> but they get named. It, yeah. They get named by somebody. <laughs> they get named by somebody and which mm -hmm. I actually did a video on it. I actually do think there's, I actually do think there's a benefit to it. I think the idea is that it gets, it gets clients, it gives them something to say when they come and ask for a cut. They're like, oh, you know, have you heard about, you heard about the kitty cut and they show you a picture of it and you're like, well, yeah, that's like the lob I've been doing for the past three years. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? But, and that's fine. You know that, you know that, but then you say, oh yeah, I love that cut. That'd be amazing. You know, and you already know how to do it, but it's like, what are they seeing or what are, what is it that that you're trying to, they're trying to get across to you is, oh, I like all those, those PC layers in it. I like how light it looks and which I think is beneficial to 
the client and beneficials of the stylist, I think it gives them more ways of explaining a haircut to you. Um, whereas a lot of times they don't, they, you know, someone doesn't come in and say, if they don't just come in and say, Oh, I know what you do. I want a Bob. I want a Bob like you do it. Great. That's fine. But if, when those people come in and say like, Oh yeah, I'd really like, you know, uh, the hush cut with the curtain bangs, you hmm. at least I, as a stylist know what they're talking about, you know? And then right, you can get right. down, ask them more questions to get to the bottom of, okay, when you say hush cut, show me some pictures that you've seen, um, that you like, and then you can get to the bottom of, oh, they like all that texture and that slimming shape around the neckline and it opens up the face. Okay, cool. Right. You know, so right. I think that, I think that though, yeah, I think that's where I guess where we're at with the naming of, of haircuts. Yeah. I took a yeah. tangent there from what you actually asked me, but. Um, no, that's good though. That's good though. Um, because everybody deals with that. And how, how much liberty do you take in, um, and recommending certain shapes for certain people, you know, based on their, based on their own shape. Um, so I, I always tend to, I always tend to ask, I guess I, I try not to uh, really do things so much off face shape. If someone, if someone is not, um, cons- unless someone's very concerned with it, I guess. So if someone's concerned with a haircut for their face shape, then I will talk to them about, well, what areas of your face um, are you either trying to accentuate or de-accentuate? Or you know what I'm saying? Um, mm-hmm. Then they can tell me, oh, I don't like how wide my cheeks are. Okay, great. Or I don't like how uh, how my you know my my chin is my chin is short or my chin is too long and I don't like a bob to make my face look longer. So then you can decide, okay, well maybe we need to adjust the length to suit your needs or I need to create some layering um, around the sides of, of your, around your cheekbone area to make your face look a little wider, to bring a little volume there for you. Or maybe a bang would be a great idea to, you know, open up your face a little bit more so your face doesn't uh, look so small, you know? So I, I think that, I think that those things all play a role there. But then I also, I also will get the client who's like, I'm not concerned with like my face shape at all. Like I just, I want a shag haircut. And I would say, okay, great. Um, here's the reason. Here's the things I'm going to do, and here's the you know here's the reasons I think we should do them. And then they're excited about it, and they know. I either ask them, hey, are you comfortable with styling your hair like this, um, or do you want more of a wash and wear style? You know, I think that those questions are just they help you get to the bottom of what the client wants, and then that way, when they leave, they either have the tools. I can teach them the tools necessary to style their hair. Or I can give them the haircut that, you know, just needs to be shaken out and scrunched, you know, whichever, mm-hmm. whatever they're looking for. Mm-hmm. And with your clients, your longtime clients, how often do you have this conversation with them? How often do you bring up the um, the potential to change, change things up? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a, I'm definitely a fan of. Or I definitely teach the, I guess that is, you should check in with your clients. Um, you know, every every couple of visits, I feel like. I'm like, how's, you know, do you want to change anything with the haircut? Or or I will just say, hey, I've got an idea for your haircut. Are, would you open to trying this out? Sometimes it's yes. Sometimes it's no. So I think a lot of times it's just, they they look at me as the professional. Or, you know, you listeners, they're looking, as you, looking to you as the professional to you know, just give some guidance. You know, I, I, I don't like to be the person who like shoves them into something like, Hey, I, we're going to chop your hair off today. I think you'd look amazing. I think we should do this. Like, I'm like, I might suggest it and say, are you comfortable with that? And maybe they're not that day, but maybe in three months, they're like, you know what? I think I am ready to chop it off, you know, mm-hmm. or I think I am ready for curtain banks or I really want to do a shag. I'm ready to get rid of this length. You know, so it's just kind of constantly like I'll like every couple of visits, like maybe drop a hint or drop an idea on them and then they can decide from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so um, we just got through the holiday season, typically the most, the busiest season in our, our industry. Have you noticed any uh, changes in client behavior? Um, Are are people, uh, I don't know anything. Um, I, you know, it's funny is 
you know, I'd seen some posts uh, the other day on Instagram about, you know, being slow in January, February, things like that. And I, I, I guess responded to those posts myself. So I do, I don't personally see any um, slowing down right now. And I, I actually am the busiest I've ever been in my entire career uh, in the salon. Um, but I remember maybe even five, six years ago, still being in that, in that realm of, yeah, you kind of got yourself prepared for January, February being slower, like clients not coming, you know, maybe not coming in as often, or they, they push their appointments to March, um, instead of coming in in January and February, um, and definitely having those gaps and holes in my schedule. I definitely was there, I think, at one point in my career, but I feel like now I, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just because, again, just building brick by brick by brick your career over time. I'm at this point where I've got my clientele built up so strong and my also mixed with doing, I guess, doing well at social media. Um, I've got clients coming from – on, you know, online, finding me online and, mm -hmm. and, you know, filling in all those gaps, I guess. Oh, that's fantastic. New clients coming in. And so, and they're coming in through Instagram or TikTok or both, or are you on TikTok? I am on TikTok, but I only just started using TikTok recently. Um, and honestly, right now, I, you know, I'll respond to, I'll respond to comments on there. But I actually I have a virtual assistant who does my posting on TikTok um, and he'll do he'll do my posts on my on the Bobco for me on the Instagram. And then I jump on and I'll throw up stories or and respond to all the comments myself. But yeah, I would say most of my clients, though, like new clients are typically saying, I found you on Instagram um, and I want to, you know, I want to book a haircut or they just find me and they can go book right there. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, you know, it seems like we've been talking about Instagram for 10 years. Um, and, and, and so <laughs> yeah. at the risk of, of repeating something um, ad nauseum and boring our listeners. Um, <laughs> right. I, I mean, however, I haven't we haven't talked to I haven't talked about this with a with a guest on the podcast in probably a year. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask the question. Um, what do you find is generating the most activity from, you know, uh, local, right? Cause we're, we're in a, we're in a human to human, uh, personal sort of business here. Um, what's yeah. bringing in most of those new clients for you on Instagram? Is it still hashtagging? Is it, you know, what, what are you doing that you find successful? Yeah. So I feel like I actually don't, I almost never put hashtags. Like I haven't really physically put hashtags on any of my posts in probably over a year. Um, really, it's just a lot of keywords, um, making sure I like put the words, you know, obviously talk about Bob haircut in, in my caption, I'll write Bob haircut or, you know, write even typing in like certain like um, techniques I'm using. Um, and then uh, making sure that uh, when I'm posting my picture on my uh, grid, like on the mm -hmm. reels grid or on my uh, regular feed is just making sure that that, that, that cover photo um, it has either says something to do with what they're going to see, or they're seeing like my hands cutting hair. So they kind of know right away what they might see uh, when they mm -hmm. click on that. And so yeah. you must be geotagging. I mean, from the standpoint of somebody who's living in Fort Collins um, I, I don't know if Fort Collins is small enough for them to simply no voltage, um, no. you know, but okay. So it are, how does, how is somebody searching these days? Do you think for the most part on Instagram, you know, over the past couple of years, I don't know. I don't really know. I, I have not been, I've honestly not been geotagging and I don't know what, I've done. I really don't. I really can't. It's so hard to explain. I feel like I've had several videos over the past uh, couple years that have like they've just gone viral for some crazy reason. Like I did some very purposefully like interesting techniques with haircutting that 
a lot of people liked. Also mm-hmm. got, you know, some people, you know, it's obviously controversial. Like I did some like the double comb haircutting technique that actually Philip Wilson's the one that I first saw do it. Philip Wilson's amazing. Um, I did some videos with the double, you know, the double comb haircutting, the bob. You know, some people think it's amazing. Some people think it's idiotic, which, again, some of those videos went viral for me. Uh, I've also had the undercut bob. I do a lot. That's like my signature thing I do is the undercut bob. And I teach a lot about why I think it's an amazing way to cut bobs. And I, again, I just, I had several videos just go absolutely like, I mean, like 7 million views, like stuff like that was happening. And I don't know, I don't know why. I just think it was just one of those things that people like watching haircutting. Like I've had, I get, I get like just clients, clients are like even just watching it. It's like ASMR. It's, they yeah. like watching haircutting. It's a satisfying thing to watch. And a lot it of them is. reach out to me. And they're like, I, I literally get people reaching out to me every single day. Where do you live? Where's your salon? I want to book with you. I want to get in with you. You know, it's, and I'll, a lot of times I'll tell them where I live and they're like, ah, oh, you know, like, ah, oh, dang it. Do you know anybody in my area? Do you know anybody in my area? And right. that was, that was another thing that came down with the Bobco is I'm working on certifying stylists that I've trained. Cause a lot of people are like, well, do you have anyone you've trained? Who, who have you trained in my area? Is there any salons right. you've trained in my area? I mean, you can, it's, it's hilarious. I mean, you can almost hear the desperation in there <laughs> in, when they message me. I mean, it's, it's, right. it's wild. And so right. that was another, that was another thing behind the education that I'm creating is that I'm, I'm trying to teach. I'm again, it's like, I'm teaching people the way that I do hair. It's, it's based in the fundamentals Um, so you're getting, you're getting based in the fundamentals, but it's techniques and things that I do that I think work really well, really well. And I've built a great clientele from, and obviously a lot of people seem to like it. So, you know, that's what I'm trying to do, I guess, with my education as well is, is hopefully to train other sauce across the country that like, I could be like, yeah, go to, you know, uh, pure metal salon. That's one of my salons It's in my education online. Right. And I'm going to be going to teach at their salon soon. It's like, it's just, it's, it's exciting. So, yeah. You know, I I have this conversation every so often, you know, a hairdresser who's struggling to, you know, build a clientele. And um, I say to them all the time, and there's, there is a, there is a surprisingly large percentage of the population who is looking for a good beauty professional right now. And you simply need to make yourself yeah. searchable. You need to make yourself findable. Yes. And some people don't want to go on Instagram or they don't, they don't want to go on Google or they don't want to update their website so to to make sure that it's you know has the most basic sort of uh, uh, SEO functionality. But um, it's there are constantly people looking for beauty professionals every single day in your area. You know, I, I have people who constantly yeah. ask me to refer them to beauty professionals, you know, who, who are yeah. good at a bob or good at balayage or good at whatever. Um, there's constantly yep. the, the number of, of potential clients out there is seemingly unlimited. It's seemingly unlimited. Unlimited. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. really amazing. It, it's really amazing. So, uh, I always, I always um, encourage people, and it's one of the reasons we do this podcast is, you know, what are the best practices for being searchable, for being findable? You know, what, what should you do to, um, to, yeah. to find those people who are looking because they're out there and they're, they're everywhere. I used to do these things, man on the street interviews, right? So I go out there, Donovan and I would go out there, this was pre COVID and I would have a microphone and yeah. I would talk to random people on the street in LA and I, God, I mean, probably 50% of the time, the stranger that I would, that would stop and talk to me, um, doesn't have a consistent beauty professional, you know, or, or isn't a, isn't a regular salon client, you know, would love to have a better haircut or would love to try new things with color, but doesn't regularly go to the salon, hasn't found, you know, somebody that they're comfortable with, confident in or whatever. And there's, it's just, I constantly say this because I think it's important. Oftentimes we don't see the forest through the trees, right? That there's so much potential um, out there. So anyway, take that for what it is. All right. It really is. What is the most difficult conversation you've ever had with a client in your chair? (laughs) 
you know what? I have I have this client. I have this client right now that they are they've been obsessed with uh, this is great actually they've been obsessed with a haircut that they've had for really their most of their life they they used to live in Georgia she had this hairstylist there who you know she loved the way he cut her hair and she wants me to cut her hair like he does you know whatever <laughs> and she brings me she brings me photos of herself when she was 30 years old. No, and don't she say is that. now she is now in her 70s. Oh boy. <laughs> and this lady, I lo- absolutely I actually absolutely love her. She is um she's a very nice lady. She's definitely got some grit to her. Um <laughs> and you know, we're always we're always um, she always want, I'm always trying to work out the line. She was you got to get the line right, you know? And I'm like she's got this southern accent. She's awesome. So but she's like, you gotta get that line up. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, it's always there's always something I need to do to this haircut. So <laughs> right. it's one of those haircuts. It's just this client. I, I do love her. She's great, and she's she, she keeps coming back to me, and she's <laughs> always you always have great conversations. And but it's it's one of those clients who's like she always kind of keeps me humble. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I feel like you gotta have you gotta have a couple of those clients who are like they keep you humble. And they you know, they make sure you, you make sure you're on your game every time, which I think is actually good. But she's she's always hard because I'm always telling her I'm like, well, if I raise the line that much, you're going to lose your weight line. She's always concerned about her weight line, and you know if I bring it up, we might lose the weight line. And she's like, well, she's like, you got to do what you think is right. But I think you know so and so said to do it this way, and I'm like, okay, well I'll try. You know, so it's, I'm, it's it is always kind of a and I can be real with her, which is good. I can kind of say what I right. need to say, and she'll she'll take yeah. it and she'll be like, all right, you know, but um. So I feel like, I don't know, that's just a funny one, I guess, but. <laughs> that's hilarious. I mean, yeah, you're yeah. never a hundred percent with her. You're never a hundred percent. It's never a hundred percent, right? That what yep. you do with her yep. cut. There's always something. I love that so yeah. much, but she keeps coming yeah. back to you, right? So she does. So she, she keeps coming back to me though. She, she probably knows she's a pain in the ass and, and she <laughs> believes that you're the one, you're the only one who can give her what she needs. At least the only one here, despite flying back to Georgia. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Right. You know, yeah. it, it reminds it reminds me of a girlfriend I dated a thousand years ago, and okay. very 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 pretty girl. Um, but she uh, insisted she would go to the same hairdresser that her mom went to, and that it was an older hairdresser, and her mom insisted on having the same style. Uh, I mean, probably working on decades and it, and it was, you know, it was kind of shoulder length, maybe a little bit past shoulder length and it would curl under, it would curl under up towards the jawline yeah. like this. And, and my girlfriend who was maybe like 18 or whatever, she would go to the same hairdresser. She would get the exact same hairstyle. And I remember at a certain point I was thinking to myself, like, geez, like that, that hairstyle sure seems like 15 years ago. And, you know, I was the same age. And so I, I didn't have, I wasn't terribly observant about hair at the time, but I knew enough to know that her hairstylist was, her hairstyle was at least 15 years old because I would look around and see other people. <laughs> they had, they had yeah, better yeah. looking, better looking haircuts going on. Yeah, their hair didn't look and the same, right? Yeah, their hair color didn't look more the modern. Same. <laughs> right. And so fast forward a couple decades, and I think I saw her a couple years ago on Facebook. She got married. She, she lives somewhere else. She got married to some dude. And she has the same haircut where it kind of comes down. Yeah. It's, it's, all, it's all the same tone. It comes down, and then it curls up yeah. under. And it's, it's yeah. just hilarious. Like nobody... Nobody. Yeah. I mean, is, is she going to the same hairstyles? I figure that guy would have maybe retired by now, and somebody else, maybe her current husband. Nobody has said to her like, maybe you should. <laughs> by now, right? Kinda, yeah. That's exactly. Yeah, and this lady, same. I can't. I cannot get her to change. Like, I've, I've I, tried. Of like, not. we tried. She even let me try one time. Like, I gave her a different haircut, and she's uh-huh. like, "No, we got to go back." And I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> you know, let's, she at least let me try." Yeah. <laughs> That's that's great. It sounds like she took it well. She did. <laughs> yeah, that's good. If you could wave a wand and change anything about the industry at all right now, what would it be? I think maybe I would just wave the wand and say that that people could 
would magically just open up, I guess. I just feel like mm-hmm. stylists sometimes are, are closing themselves down. And I feel like I wish I could wave the wand and say, open yourself up and expose yourself to the industry. Like, like we said earlier, you said, you know, there's so many people looking for great stylists. And Mm -hmm. I think that so many stylists are scared to either open up to their, to the stylists in their salon or even their, you know, across the hall from them. If they're in salon suites, they're scared to Mm -hmm. open up to each other. Um, and be vulnerable and say like, look, I'm not good at this. I'm not good mm-hmm. at doing blonde, blonde, yeah, um, like even platinum, like a platinum card. That's an old terminology, mm-hmm. but a platinum yep. card. Even I say, I'm not, I'm not good at doing platinum cards. I always send them somewhere else. If someone wants that for me, I say, you don't want to see me for a platinum card. Yeah, I don't have the patience, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. So I, but I, yeah. the cool thing is, I do have community, and I can say, why don't you go to this this other person in my salon or why don't you go to this you know salon down the street from me or across mm-hmm. town from me like i feel like i don't know just i don't know open up put yourself yeah. out there yeah 100% yeah. do you have any hair horror stories hair horror stories mhm who man i think i did a long time ago this is this is definitely early in my career did a did a color did a color and client was not happy i was like you know level whatever like a level two stylist at the time and my you know my mentor in the salon had to had to <laughs> bail me out <laughs> you know i was uh mm-hmm. i was definitely it was like you know one of those humbling moments of like yeah i either i didn't ask enough questions or you know didn't didn't quite understand the color uh, theory enough at the time you know maybe uh mm-hmm. you know i think i just i turned the scales hair way too dark and I think it was like slightly purple too. And I was like, you know, we had to do all sorts of things to get her to make her happy. But it was, uh, it was definitely one of those like humbling moments when I was like, you know, yeah, that, that's one. I guess it still haunts me every now and then. <laughs> we all have those moments, don't we? Yeah. 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 In, in the range of hair horror stories, we have a very, very broad uh, set of examples of things that can go wrong. And I always find that the new hairdressers love them the most because, you know, they, they, they're petrified when they go to the salon. They're petrified when a new client sits in the chair. They're petrified of having a hair horror story. But of course, the, the <laughs> beneficial parts of these stories is that 99% of the time things are just fine afterwards. And, yeah. you know, the world does not stop turning. No. And you learn and you learn, you just learn from your mistake, you know, that's right. It's like, it always ends up being like almost a good thing, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Right. Exactly. Any last words for the community? Um, any last words? Okay. Let's say, I would say, look, just going back to what I was talking about is waving the magic wand. But like, I think I wish, I wish more stylists, honestly, even as saturated as Instagram and social media is with hairstylists. I feel like stylists have just, they, you've got to put yourself out there. You've got to put yourself in the social media realm or online in some way being searchable for clients to find you. Um, it, it, and just, just don't be afraid of the camera. You know, like everyone, everyone's always awkward when they first start in with putting yourself on Instagram. It's always a, a, a lot of, to figure out. Um, but I feel like just get out there, put yourself out there and, and then just keep learning. I feel like it's just like, don't, I'm, I've always been that way. Just don't think, you know, whenever, whenever you think, you know, everything is when you realize how much you don't know. I don't know. I just, I just feel right. like, just remember That's that. Right. It's just like, whenever you think, you know, some, yeah. everything about something you really don't. And there's just right. always things to revisit. There's always things, always things to refresh on. And I feel like that's what that's what keeps propelling this industry, as we all know, is, is education. That's why education is so huge. It's just you can always be learning something. There's you know, we can be learning about hair color. We can be learning about hair cutting. We can now be learning about, you know, photography and videography. That's those are things that we have to do now. There's so yeah. many skills you can learn in this industry to make yourself better and a more attractive, um, you know, more attractive offering to the clients that are, that are looking for you, you know? Absolutely. hundred percent. You said it so well. Ray, <laughs> Ray I, I, I almost called you Ray Voltage. 
Ray <laughs> well, Hornback. That, that works. <laughs> Ray Voltage. So good to talk to you. Ray Hornback, you're <laughs> Ray Voltage Beauty on Instagram. And it's so yeah. great meeting you and, and talking to you. Really appreciate it. That was super cool to chat with you, Eric. I, I wanted to be on the podcast for a while, and I was very excited to get oh. the opportunity to be on it. And um, yeah, it was super, super fun to chat with you. Thank you. Humbled for the time. And, and, and I think the listeners really, really appreciate it. So hope to see you soon at a hair show or something. Do you ever get out to L.A.? Uh, I haven't been out to L.A. in like forever. Um, last time I was there was was right before COVID, I guess. It, was a bit, it would have been 20, 2019 or yep. whenever. I, I, I went to the Long Beach ISSC right. show. Yeah, um, that, that would have been was, in uh, January 2020. I was there. Yeah. Okay. You were there. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that was uh, mm-hmm. that was a fun. Yeah, we had, we had a good time. I went with some buddies, and but that was yeah. the last time I was out in LA. And then um, probably this year, like I'll be I'll be at the uh, the Masters of Balayage Hero Show in San Diego. Um, mm-hmm. And then I've got a bunch of classes coming up. I've got classes um, every month until May right now. Um, at different salons, they're all they're all already booked, so I can't sell any more tickets. But they're already they're already fully booked. But um, I'll be doing some be doing some other cool stuff too. So always have always have fun fun things on the uh, on the horizon. So I love it. All right, listeners, yeah. check them out. Ray Voltage Beauty. Thanks, Ray. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Eric. Appreciate it.